next speaker is Dr. Fred Luskin. And Dr. Luskin is the director of the Stanford Forgiveness Projects, which are a series of ongoing workshops and research studies at Stanford that explore the effectiveness of forgiveness practices in different populations. And thus far, the Forgiveness Project have successfully worked with populations of victims of violence in Northern Ireland, Sierra Leone, and even survivors of the attacks on the World Trade Center on 9-11. In addition to his work with the Forgiveness Projects, Dr. Luskin has successfully uh, worked with corporate settings, medical settings, legal settings, and religious settings. He is a senior consultant in health promotion at Stanford University and a professor at the Institute of Transpersonal Psychology. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Fred Luskin. Thank you. Well, hi. Um, you know, it, it's whenever I come to these kind of things and <coughs> see other people's presentations, like the one there on breathing, it, it reminds me that people like me who claim sometimes to have invented something new have invented nothing. <laughs> no, because what, what she was describing and the work that we do, the yogis figured this stuff out a few thousand years ago. And we're just putting it in different terms. You know, what, one of the ways that I started to teach forgiveness, and I've been doing that now for about 20 years, was very simple around the breath. I recognized that when I was unforgiving or judgmental or harsh, I wasn't breathing. And when I recognized that that had become a pattern, which is at some level almost what I would call victimhood, that you create mental schema, you create physical representations of that mental schema of a body under stress. And that body under stress can no longer learn. And so what a simple way of understanding why people can stay stuck for a whole lifetime and stuff that happened 10, 20, 30, 5, whatever it is years ago. And, and what a waste. I mean, I, um, I would look at my own life, I would look at people's lives around me, and I would think, what a waste. What a, what a waste arguing about the past. What a waste thinking that life didn't give me everything I wanted. What a, what a real waste in this, now that I'm old enough to realize even how short this life actually is. But what a waste. And, 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 it, and it's very interesting. I mean, it's, I go all over the place and I talk and I remind people to let go of stuff. But unfortunately or fortunately at many conferences or even just on the campus that I teach in, Forgiveness is not the prescription that most people want. And it translates even, I was once asked to give a series of talks, or I was part of a series of talks at a church in Southern California. I live in Northern California. And the, the woman, the minister, had set up um, talks on like gratitude and awe <clears throat> and compassion and abundance and all these positive things and they got like 80 people to attend and she put a little section out on forgiveness there were like five and it's not that's not uncommon because for whatever reason i mean i know some of the reason we hold on to this stuff like most of us hold on to our wounds and even more terribly for this world, and in fact, one of the prime reasons why this world is in the awful condition that it's in, is that all of us use our wounding to explain why it is that we don't have to be kind. All of us. I don't have to love you because two years ago and seven minutes ago, you didn't love me the way I wanted you to. I don't have to love you because my parents didn't love me enough, therefore I'm off the hook for how unkind I am to you. 
I don't have to love you because you're black, green, um, whatever it is, Catholic, Protestant, all. The, we've worked all over the world with people who have unbelievably tribal reasons for hating other people because they've been harmed. And I think to myself, what a, what a, what a sad state of affairs, you know, that, that we linger and create stories around and hold on to often the worst parts of our life. And, and, and to me, I mean, again, when I was thinking this stuff up, the, the, the lines that came to me that explained why forgiveness seemed important in positive psychology, because when I started doing this, nobody else was, was the Dalai Lama's thing on happiness, which is if you want to be happy, you have to practice the conditions of happiness. If you want to be unhappy, you practice the conditions of unhappiness. So I took that and I thought, well, if I'm pissed off, even if the Dalai Lama's pissed off, he's not happy. You could get Gandhi here and get him pissed off and he's not happy, except those people don't get pissed off. But being pissed off is practicing a condition of unhappiness. Letting it go or practicing the conditions of happiness. And I thought how unbelievably simple and why isn't this being talked about? I started the Stanford Forgiveness Project in 1996 as my doctoral dissertation from Stanford. Um, when I started this, again, this is before positive psychology even came into um, it, its emergence. I would go into groups of therapists and they would give me grief because the whole world was trained on what was, is considered negative psychology. <clears throat> and I remember when I was being trained as a therapist, I mean, this, this is just my language, but I would think to myself, why would I want to spend my life in a little room with unhappy people? <laughs> like, what, what was that? And so, and, and what I came to understand was that first, forgiveness had been really hard for me. And even when it was hard for me, I'd had a meditation practice, and I was just about a licensed therapist, had completed thousands of hours of, you know, training. And yet nobody was talking about the, the quality of holding your woundedness holding it, like not running from it, not blaming anybody else, just holding the fact that you and me and everybody else were wounded people. That's part of the game. You know, like a Monopoly board, you go around and you pass go and you go to jail and all that stuff. On this game, everybody gets hurt. Everybody. Everybody gets hurt. Everybody gets hurt multiple times. It, it's built into the fabric of the game. You know, and that's, that's the intellectual hook that people don't grasp. There's affective hooks and there's all sorts of hooks, but suffering, and the Buddhists explored this territory, suffering is built in. You know, every relationship that we enter into is a risk, every single one. The certainty is that the relationship will end. That's the only certainty. The question is how. You know, it's not, it's not like there is any happily ever after. So suffering and loss and pain are built into the very fabric of it. When you love somebody, you're entering into an agreement where you know you're going to lose them. You know, whether it's they get tired of you or they want a different model or they die or you die or you want a different model. But it's all precarious. And so we, we, we intellectually don't have appropriate thinking or schemas or categories 
even as to how to hold this life experience. You know, that, that we are a very, very tiny dot of consciousness in an enormity. And in that enormity, we don't understand very much. And we don't recognize our vulnerability. And we don't recognize that it's only through that vulnerability that we can love. You know, that, that the very precariousness and the very vulnerable nature of it is what allows love to be so real. Because it's chosen and it's freely given and it's built on a foundation that nobody is perfect and we all make mistakes. And so into that incredible uncertainty and incredible like lack of control, one of the ways we try to make believe we have control is by getting pissed off or frustrated or angry about things that don't go the way we want. That, that's one of our pseudo mechanisms of control, that okay, this didn't work out the way I wanted to, therefore I'm gonna freeze it in space, and I'm gonna say 2004, bad year. And then I'm gonna hold that image in my mind and let it take up like precious real estate here. 2004, bad space. Last girlfriend, really bad space. <laughs> and they just sit there. And then they hold, they hold, they hold not just space, but they hold basis of relating to reality. You know, people aren't safe. Well, it's true, people aren't safe. That, that's a truth. That's not located in just one person. But the point is, what we need to do is see life, I'm, I'm gonna say, openly cultivate enough skills for happiness, which is how I teach forgiveness, so that we can hold life's pain, which is why the happiness training is so essential. Because if you haven't cultivated a whole host of positive experiences, if you're not full of gratitude for what you do have, if you don't feel somewhat lucky just to be here, then it's impossible to hold the suffering. But if you do cultivate all sorts of positive awarenesses, if you do, and I, I mean this with all sincerity, if you do practice belly breathing, you will become more forgiving because you won't be sending so much stress chemicals and so much information back and forth in your brain to how much threat you're under. You know, whenever you even do, just take a few minutes to quiet your breathing down. You know, there's this bi-directional loop going on all the time between parts of your threat-sensing brain and the rate and depth of your breathing. And when the rate and depth of your breathing is slow and rhythmic, your brain recognizes you're fine. When, as you had just shown, your body can repair itself, but your mind can repair itself because you're not flooding it with adrenaline and threat, which is why our cell phone addicted culture is making everybody more threatened and less safe because we are constantly distracting ourselves and constantly multitasking. And the brain, whenever you ask it to multitask, knows you're in danger. Because only a person who was not safe would do two things at one time. The same person savers, at least from the brain's point of view. They just they're just there in their life. But when you're trying to do two and three things, it sends a very strong signal that you're not safe enough. When you're in a hurry, whenever you have the mental consciousness of hurry, your body responds as if you're in danger. Because you are in danger. 
because you're missing out at some level on this beautiful world. But when you add hurry and you add cell phone use all the time and distractedness, then we are almost always creating patterns of we're not okay. And it's very hard in that patterning to let stuff go. It's very hard. Which is how you see people, so to speak, tense in Whole Foods. <laughs> no, you think about that. What kind of literally nutcase <laughs> would be tense in the most abundant food source that the universe has ever seen? <laughs> and if you ask yourself, having, I'm sure most of you have been tense at some point in Whole Foods or Safeway <laughs> or wherever, or whatever the, the supermarket is here, if you've been tense in Whole Foods, then you know you have some happiness work to do. <laughs> no, it's that simple. I mean, it's just because if you don't notice your abundance, nobody can do anything for you. I mean, it, you're very far gone. But you may only be far gone as we're all far gone, and just in restlessness. You know, just in sheer restlessness, sheer lack of peace. And so when you're in restlessness or you're in lack of peace, you're not breathing properly. And your brain is getting all sorts of signals that things aren't as they should be. And it's a scary place to be. Well, the same thing happens whenever you haven't forgiven anything. Whenever you have a story in your mind that says, this person's bad, that was not a good experience, this, these people can't be trusted, this is not okay, and you create patterns and schema around that, then that influences you relentlessly with some sense of danger. And as long as there's danger, your body doesn't relax and you don't heal in a certain way. So you have to change that story. I mean, from what I understand now, forgiveness is simply a change in story. It's a change in story from they're terrible and they screwed up, or I'm terrible and I screwed up, or this is such a tough world, which it is. Don't kid yourself. It's a very tough place to have taken a human birth. It is very hard. But the whole benefit of positive psychology is that it's a reminder that the world is both hard and beautiful. And it's always going to be hard and beautiful. And we have to make some decision as to where we put our attention within those places. So what I have seen is people who are unforgiving, or even if they have a, even if there's just one category that they're unforgiving about, then towards that category or towards that experience, they've lost all sight of the fact that it's also beautiful. People who can forgive tend to have a wider place and they have more of an asset deficit kind of accounting of their life. Yeah, that sucked, this was great. The problem is the way our brain is wired, you can't have an equal ratio of suck and great because the brain takes that as a calamity. What you need is more great and that's why it's hard. This is true in relationships also. In order to find your life satisfactory, you have to have many more positives than negatives. And in fact, there's some, I, I don't know if this is pure research or hypothesis, that when it sinks below three to one or somewhere in that range, you start to feel bad. Th three positive to one negative. It does do that in relationship. So if you're in a relationship with somebody 
and you don't see that their positives far outweigh their negatives, you feel bad. Because the brain over experiences and over retains the negative. And you have to work to find the positive. That, that, that's just our biological programming. You have to work at it. Because the positive are not required for your survival. But paying attention to the negative is required for your survival. So let me, let me ask you again to do a belly breathing practice because this is central to forgiveness. In fact, I have found this central to any form of mental health. I would just suggest that we can counter condition a little bit through breathing some of the stress response. So what I would like all you to do again is exactly as you were just told, relax for a moment. Just relax for a moment. And put down your toys. <laughs> if you have a cell phone that is particularly dependent on you, <laughs> please tell it that you will be back. <laughs> have a little Valium drip for it so it can handle the separation. You know, and just allow it, just you know, say, promise, mommy will be back. <laughs> I remember the first time that we left our daughter at preschool, and, and she was really tiny, but, you know, we both had to work. And I remember my wife, like, just simply telling her, like, 500 times, mommy will be back, mommy will be back. And the kid doesn't know what she's talking about. Mommy's leaving. She's terrified. So tell your phone you'll be back. Now, what I would like you to do is relax, which is no easy thing. Actually relax. And there is no relaxing without belly breathing. Uh, that's for, it's either good news or bad news to you, but there's no relaxing without belly breathing. You're not relaxed until your lower abdomen relaxes. And you're not relaxed until your breathing opens your abdomen and expands it so that your brain gets the signal that you're okay. So what I'd like you to do is consciously, and this, this can take some work, consciously remind yourself about how safe you are right now because that's what your belly holds on. Remind yourself you're safe, that you're loved, that you're fed, that you have value. So you can really relax your belly. The other piece that makes this really hard is most of us try to suck in our bellies so that people don't think we have one. <laughs> it's not that effective a strategy for happiness. <laughs> you may think you're putting one over on somebody, but they know you have a belly. <laughs> so relax. It's a, it's a shell game. Just relax. You're fine. Even if your belly does move and get bigger, you're fine. But that's the hardest piece of this. You're fine. You have to understand that no animal in nature will have a vulnerable belly unless they're safe. You're among them. If you're worried all the time about whether you're thin enough, or whether your belly is too big, you will never feel safe. And your entire nervous system's purpose is to make you safe. That's it. So you need to answer that question for your mind and body that you're safe. And then you can start to let stuff go. You can't until then. You have to be safe. 
And then what I'd like you to do is just while you're sitting here, bring an image to your mind of someone you adore. Just bring an image to your mind of someone you adore. And hold that image as delicious as you can make it. Like, don't be chintzy on your image. Picture someone you adore and feel it. Feel it. Feel how lucky you are. Feel how much you care for them. Allow it to quiet your heart. And just bring your attention for another moment to almost like you're just you being quiet and peaceful and loving. And then let that go. Just let that go. And then just take a breath, allow your eyes to open or refocus on me, but don't fidget. See if you can not fidget. See if you can not grab your toys. Just sit for a moment. One of the things that we learned or have been studying is that place in you that emerges when you quiet your breathing down and you open your heart, that's the part of you that already knows how to forgive. Like it, it's not dependent on anybody else. And it literally has nothing to do with the past. It's just you. And the mind-body experience that you bring to the moment. So when you quiet down a little bit and when you open your heart, these are both and in large part things that can be practiced. Like forgiveness is, a, is, a, is actually a statement about our whole life. It's not about grandma or your ex. Even though exes, that's the thing that brings more people to forgiveness trainings I don't think there's even anything in second place. <laughs> and, and I'm going to tell you that since 80 to 90 percent of people who attend forgiveness trainings are women, it's bad men that bring 80 to 90 percent. I, I, I like to refer them as ex-husbands from hell. Um, but that's who brings, that's what brings it because we're so raw and vulnerable with intimacy. But if you can quiet down just for a moment and remember you live in an abundant universe that takes care of you also and that you are always capable of finding love even if it's that big, then you again we reclaim a little piece of the place inside of us that we think life took from us. Because that's what unforgiveness is. You say at some level, I'm never going to fully open back up because it took it from me. It doesn't, I'm not whole anymore. Which is simply not, not accurate at all. First of all, you never were totally whole in the first place. Secondly, nobody can take anything. But we have to practice, you know, which is why the kind of training that you get at a happiness conference is essential, because the practice is simple. Here's another practice, just very simple. While you're sitting there, just take two breaths into and out of your belly, just two. You don't have to close your eyes, do anything. Just take two breaths into and out of your belly. And if you can, with like now with the third breath as you inhale, can you just be like aware 
of what an unbelievable gift it is to be alive and breathing. Like it, it's just paying attention. Like can you inhale and even contemplate for a moment the staggering number of chemical reactions that that breath engenders that you know is life. Like you, we don't have to go far. So that's a forgiveness practice, that's a happiness practice. They're so simple. One of the things I also realized, and, and this is uncomfortable for both me and everybody, is like when you're asking yourself, should I forgive myself? Should I forgive other people? Should I forgive the universe? Whatever it is. You're not actually talking about just one instance. And, and this, is, this is really an important distinction because it's uncomfortable. What you're actually asking yourself is, a total life question, which is, have I been given enough love? Have I had enough good experiences? Have I had enough abundance for me not to hold on to this experience as a reason why I'm not happy enough? Like, that's the actual forgiveness question. Has life given me enough? Have I paid enough attention to the beauty of it so that I have a foundation where I can hold suffering or difficulty and not desire to stay stuck in it. The only way you can do that, the only way anybody can do that, is by practicing some senses of gratitude and appreciation and awe. You know, there's only a few studies about things that really make forgiveness easier. And one, of course, is a real apology, which is very different than most people's apology. If you listen to most people's apology, it's, I'm sorry you feel bad. <laughs> no, it's true. If you get a, <laughs> I'm sorry that you took it so badly that you feel bad. A sincere apology has four qualities to it. I'm sorry. I did bad. I noticed that you feel bad. My fault. Link. My bad action, your bad feeling. I won't do it again. How can I make it up? That's a sincere apology. When you get one of those, forgiveness goes way higher. People who have, and this will be another duh, people who are higher in narcissism have a harder time forgiving. There's a, there's a brilliant statement, but it's <laughs> hopefully somebody paid a million dollars for that research. Um, <laughs> but the other piece is that forgiveness and gratitude go together. And that the more grateful you tend to be, the more easily you forgive. And it's much easier to influence gratitude than it is forgiveness. It makes so much sense because what you're looking at all the time is some kind of question. Has my life been good enough? Have I appreciated enough? Have I grabbed enough out of it? Have I had what I needed? If so, I'll be pleasant at Whole Foods. If so, I'll be pleasant in traffic. If so, I'll be pleasant with bad service. If so, I'll be pleasant if you make a mistake. If so, I'll be pleasant if I make a mistake. It's an overall question of how it is we perceive our lives. We think it's dependent on just one thing, and it's not. We are constantly appraising the generosity and beneficence of this universe. And so what we have found beyond any other measure 
is the absolute centrality of simple gratitude practices to foster both well-being and forgiveness. Let me give you one more just to think about while you're sitting here. Just sit here for a moment and ask yourself. These are, this is one of the practices that we use all the time. If you look over the last like two or three days, what kindness has come to you? Just ask yourself that question. Like who's been kind, who's tried to be kind? Anybody, you know, do anything. But our threat-based minds are always looking at our lives as to who wasn't kind, because that's for our survival. But we rarely take time at the end of every day just to ask ourselves, who was kind? Who reached out to us? Who listened to us? I mean, I, I have a hurt hip. So I have seen so many people be generous spirited towards me. It's hard to believe. So many people. You know, I remember, and this is separate from my hip, but I remember I've given a, a, a more past, I've given a lot of talks at Google on happiness and well-being. I did more in the past than now, but I remember once I had laryngitis and I didn't know that I could complete the talk, but so, Everybody at Google is like half my age. Um, all these lovely young people were running up to me. Oh, we can hook you up to a microphone. And you know, like, they were just unbelievably solicitous. But you have to train your mind to see it. You have to. That's not going to come just by being you. Because again, your brain and your nervous system, they're there to make sure you make it through till tomorrow. They're not there to make sure you get there tomorrow happy. You have to decide that. So the most important question, not, not for happiness so much, but for your own equilibrium in this world, is have I been loved? And am I loved? And how do people show it to me? Well, part of that is the, either the luck of the draw or the people that you have pulled into your world. But the other part is how much do you notice? Like how much do you notice? So if you have a close friend or a partner and they answer the phone when you call, that's a good thing. <laughs> no, but we set the bar so high that we lose touch. Because again, our negative brain will remember all the ways that people didn't do what we wanted. But we have to train our brain to see. We have to. And you can't do it without relaxing your belly every now and then. So you want to think about just like right at this moment, like who, generally speaking, is kind to me? And you can't even answer that question for yourself if you don't relax your belly, because the question's ridiculous in a stressed body. Because a stressed body doesn't care who's kind. But you do. So one of the things that I have found is, again, that dynamic relationship between forgiveness and gratitude, and the unfortunate reality that we have much more control of what we pay attention to than we like to admit. So one of the ways that we handle our vulnerability as human beings is by creating grudges. Well, if we just hold on to this, then that person won't harm me again. A better way to give yourself the capacity to handle what life throws at you is build up the asset side. Actively notice the good and beauty. Go out of your way to find people's kindness and say thank you. Look for goodwill. 
look for it. Like don't, don't just wait till it falls on you, but actively look for it. Because what, again, what we have found is that that balance shifts, the sense of being a victim or aggrieved shifts. Anyway, thank you very much.